On this edition of Food for Life, Father Terry Donahue begins a series on anger. Lord, help me to do what you would do and exercise my anger in a righteous way according to right reason and proportionate to the evil, to correct the wrong, to right the injustice. I heard a story of a father of a family who was killed by a drunk driver. And as you can imagine, many members of that family, the children, were angry, were even filled with, with anger that was uncontrollable over the situation. And it brings up the question, what, what do we do as Christians when we are filled with anger? When circumstances around us lead to anger welling up within our hearts? What would Jesus do in these situations? First of all, let's look to the catechism to try to understand the passions, one of which is anger, and how we're supposed to treat them as Christians. First of all, uh, passions are emotions or, or movements of our interior life which incline us to do something or not to do something, to react to things that we see in the world. They provide a connection between what we experience with our senses and the rest of our mind kind of like a, a link where we can get a sense of what's going on inside of us and a sense of what's going on out there that's affecting us. How is the outside world affecting us? So we have uh, many different passions. We can have passions of, of desire, of fear, of aversion to things. But the one I want to focus in on is the passion of anger. And this is when we see or experience something that is evil and we resist it, we resist it interiorly. Our emotions act against it. So first of all, we have to realize that the passion of anger is not sinful in and of itself. The passion of anger is something that happens to us. And the question of, of sin or virtue is based on what we do in response to that, what we choose with our will. So passions are only take on a moral value if we start to harbor them. For instance, if we experience anger as a passing emotion, but then maybe we start to stew over it and we say, yeah, and we start to plot revenge or plot ways that we could harm someone else then we're interiorly choosing to do something that, that is wrong, or we're trying to cause harm to others, uh, maybe to try to make us feel better, or to kind of vent our anger against them. So strong feelings in and of themselves doesn't make you unholy or holy, but when we start to act on them, then that's gonna lead us along the path of virtue, where we're choosing the good, or vice, where we are habitually starting to choose something that's evil and can become a real obstacle in our spiritual life. So passions are morally good when they contribute to a good action. When we choose what's right and we help uh, bring God's order into the world, motivated even by our sense of anger at the injustice or something evil. But they can uh, lead us towards evil if we have disordered passions. For example, if we have uh, anger over uh, the injustice of, of someone robbing, uh, uh, robbing our, our store or robbing our house, uh, and that motivates us to <laughs> you know, chase down the criminal or, or uh, report it and he gets captured and then he is uh, imprisoned, well, that would prevent further evil from uh, being accomplished by that criminal. And so we've done something that leads us, that anger that welled up within us, motivated us to act for the good, to bring justice to the situation. But if, and that's reasonable anger, a reasonable level of anger used rightly. But there can be another case where maybe our, our little kid, uh, you know, uh, a two-year-old perhaps starts crying and, you know, bothering us, and we, we just kind of uh, react in anger and we 
you know, we, we harm our, our two-year-old kid. Uh, well, that would be too much of a, an overreaction against what was happening, maybe something that wasn't even intended by the two-year-old, didn't know any better. And so our anger is out of proportion. It's unreasonable, and therefore it's disordered and led us to do uh, a harmful action. So we need to look at anger in our own lives and let the Lord purify our anger from anything that would be disordered and let him work with us to know how to use our anger and channel it for the good. In order to do that, let's look at the life of Jesus because he too, being fully human, experienced all the human passions, including the passion of anger. So there's a description of this by John Paul II who writes that uh, Jesus experienced anger when on the Sabbath he cured the man with a withered hand. Jesus, first of all, asked those present, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath rather than to do evil? But they remained silent. So those who were trying to trap Jesus in this situation, are you gonna heal on the Sabbath or not? You know, they were looking down on Jesus, trying to find a way to trap him and so looking around at them with anger and grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. This is from Mark chapter three. So here we see an example of Jesus in the middle of performing this beautiful action of healing the man with the withered hand. Part of his motivation was this anger that he was experiencing of those trying to trap him and prevent this man from being cured. That the, that the authorities were trying to take advantage of this man's pitiable situation and use it for their gain rather than trying to help this man in his need. And so Jesus said, I'm curing him on the Sabbath and I'm gonna teach uh, the Pharisees a lesson in what it means to be merciful and what the true meaning of the Sabbath is, and I'm going to set things right and do something good motivated out of this anger. We see this again in the buyers and sellers who were driven out of the temple, or Matthew, in Matthew 21, writes, he drove out all those engaged in selling and buying there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Now we need to understand what was going on. This buying and selling was a necessary thing for activities within the temple, but it was meant to go on outside of the temple because the temple itself was a house of prayer and the place that they were likely doing it was in the court that was reserved for the Gentiles. In other words, those who were not Jewish, uh, you know, to come in the, the, to worship at the temple, but because these money changers were coming in and taking over that section of the temple, they were depriving the Gentiles from worshiping in the house of God. And this angered Jesus because he knew that his mission as Messiah was not only to uh, the Jewish people, but ultimately to the entire world, to bring the Gentiles into the kingdom of God. And so, this action of the money changers taking over the temple and actually corrupting the, the use of the, the money changing by, by uh, thievery, he says, was not only immoral in and of itself, but it was preventing people from worshiping the true God and coming to know the God of the Jews. So this motivates him to clean the house, <laughs> literally, in, in a very dramatic way. You wouldn't have had any ambiguity about where Jesus stood on this issue if you were there with your video camera or whatever it was. It was extremely clear. And he knew that the people who were doing this, this, uh, this uh, act of uh, buying and selling in the temple needed to be taught a lesson in very clear terms. If it could have been done in a, in a quieter way, he would have done it in a quieter way, but this was the right way to do it. It was proportionate to the situation. And obviously we see Jesus in other situations with a woman caught in adultery, responding 
dramatically differently, <laughs> right? Because of the circumstances and the situation. So he knows, as, as the perfect man, the right way to express his anger in each particular situation, always proportionate to the evil he is facing and always according to right reason. Jesus doesn't fly off the handle. He doesn't lose it. <laughs> Jesus is in full authority over all of his faculties and his reason and his exercise of his will is governing and harnessing his passions towards the greater glory of God. And so this is the model for us in how we deal with our anger. You know, first, cry out to the Lord. Say, Jesus, help me to, to use this situation and the anger I'm experiencing now. Lord, help me to do what you would do and exercise my anger in a righteous way according to right reason and proportionate to the evil, to correct the wrong, to right the injustice. And this is the take-home point that we find in the scriptures that speak about anger. Specifically, we read in Ephesians 4, 26, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity. So in this scripture, we read that it's possible to have anger, but not sin. And this would be called righteous anger. And in this, we are supposed to look at the cause of our anger. In fact, in the Greek, the word uh, paragismo, which is the word which is translated, do not let the sun go down on your anger, your paragismo. In some translations, it's even translated do not let the sun go down on the cause of your anger, indicating that we should be addressing the root cause of what's making us angry, you know, before the sun goes down. In other words, we don't want to just be kind of harboring this anger and letting it fester within us and grow out of proportion or lead to a grudge or a desire for revenge or causing harm on others. We would call this uh, wrath or... Uh, you know, uh, uh, a desire to, to kind of seek revenge in a, in a harmful way. So this would be giving the devil an opportunity, you see, if we don't deal with the anger in a healthy way. But rather, through the grace of God, asking for his help, we can move with the Lord's plan in the midst of anger. It's not easy, but it is possible when the Lord has taken over our hearts. When he is on the throne of our hearts, he reigns and rules over the whole soul. Our, our mind, our will, and our, our passions, our emotions can be harnessed. They're kind of like wild horses running this way and that, pulling us in one direction or another. But Christ comes and takes the takes up the throne on this chariot <laughs> of all these horses and he reins them in and aims them all in one direction and uses them to propel us towards his greater glory, towards doing what is right and true and just and overcoming evil with good. This has been the first segment of Father Terry Donahue's teaching on anger for an audio CD or video DVD of this complete teaching, we invite you to write to us. Our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y 2T8. When you write, ask for an audio CD or video DVD of the teaching by Father Terry Donahue on anger. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Terry Donahue continues with his teaching on anger. But there are four reasons for executing punishment. When God punishes, it always is, first of all, to protect someone from attack, to defend those who are innocent, to defend those who are unjustly harmed. 
One of the hard teachings Jesus gave was in Matthew chapter 5, when he's giving the teaching about, you know, when someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek. If someone sues you for your coat, give him your cloak as well. And then Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 5, verse 41, he says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Now we can hear these these commands of the Lord and think to ourselves, like, this is a hard teaching. I just want to refer to this uh, command to, to, to not only go one mile, but two miles. What Jesus was probably pointing to is in Jesus' time, Judea was under Roman occupation. And the Roman, the Roman soldiers, they felt they had the right to order people to carry things for them if they wanted to, if, if the Roman soldier wanted them to do that. And so a Roman soldier could be carrying a heavy load, see a bystander and say, hey, you carry this for me for a mile. And Jesus is saying, don't just carry it for one mile, carry it for two miles. And we can, we can hear Jesus' uh, teaching on this and think to ourselves, like, how do you reconcile that with the reality that Jesus has come to, to set us free. And Jesus uh, said that the Lord has sent me to proclaim release to the captives. So if Jesus came to proclaim release to the captives, why should we have to be under this oppressive burden? Jesus also says in John 8, he says, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. And Second Corinthians Paul says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Paul says in Galatians, for freedom Christ has set us free. And so again, we can ask ourselves, well, where is the freedom in this command of the Lord to carry someone's burden for two miles? Or we can also look at Jesus himself. Jesus was made captive by, by the Romans and he was, he was put, put to death put in chains, put in prison, and, and, and execute it. Where is the freedom in that? And what we need to understand is that there's a distinction between inner freedom and external physical freedom. It is true that many Christians have been put in chains. Many Christians throughout the ages have been put in prisons. Many Christians have been put to death. They've become martyrs like Jesus was put to death. And this, this is unfortunate, but, but the freedom that the Lord has come to win for us, to, to grant us, is a greater freedom. It's a, it's, a, it's a deeper freedom. It's a freedom no one can take away in this life. And that is the freedom of Christ, an inner freedom. Now, to understand this freedom, we need, again, to look at Jesus himself. Jesus, in John chapter 10, he says... I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Jesus is speaking about his death, and he's saying, I lay it down of my own accord. No one takes my life from me. And again, a response might be, but Jesus, you were, you were put in chains. You were, you were executed. How can you say you lay it down of your own accord? We need to read further to get the answer. When Pilate is with Jesus, Jesus is standing before Pilate, and Pilate says to Jesus, Do you not know that I have power to release you or crucify you? And listen to the answer Jesus gives to Pilate. Jesus says to Pilate, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. And there's the answer right there. Jesus is saying to Pilate, there is a power at work here far greater than you. You think you have power over me, but you are deceived. There is a much greater power, a higher power at work, and I freely consent to that power. And that is the power of God. God who is all-powerful, who transcends all things, and nothing escapes the power of our loving God to care for us. 
And Jesus recognized that there is more going on here than you realize, Pilate. There are things at work that I freely consent to that you don't uh, realize. It's kind of like the story of the, the young fisherman. There was a young fisherman who found a treasure map. And he, he guarded this treasure map carefully, and he had a pistol at his side all the time to defend his treasure map. And one day, a pirate found out about this treasure map. And the pirate said, Arr, I'm going to find that young fisherman. I'm going to find that young fisherman, and I'm going to take his pistol, and I'm going to take his treasure map, and I'm going to shoot him, and I'm going to find his treasure. And so one day, the pirate was sailing through the sea, and he noticed the young fisherman in his boat. And the fisherman was asleep. And in his breast pocket, there was a paper. And at his side was his pistol. So the pirate slowly approached the fisherman's boat and then he jumped into the fisherman's boat. He swung in with a, with a rope and he took the young fisherman's pistol and he took the paper out of his breast pocket and then he, he said to the fisherman as the fisherman was getting up, he said, I've got your treasure map and I've got your pistol and now I'm going to shoot you and I'm going to find your treasure. And just as the pirate was, was about to swing back onto his boat and shoot the, the young fisherman with, with the pirate had, his, had the paper in his, the, the, what he thought was the treasure map, map in his pocket, he noticed that the fisherman, the young fisherman was smiling. And he thought, why is he smiling at me? You see, what the pirate didn't realize is that the pistol he had actually didn't work. The paper he had in his pocket that he stole from the young fisherman wasn't the treasure map but was a love letter that the fisherman wrote to his girlfriend. And that just as the pilot was threatening the young fisherman, there was a shark coming up quickly behind him, about to eat the pirate. You see, there was a lot more going on than the pirate realized. And so too in our own lives, when we find ourselves kind of captive to circumstances we don't like, perhaps it's, it's sickness or some kind of illness, Perhaps we're in a work situation where those over us are being unfair or unjust. Perhaps we're, we're experiencing some kind of persecution. We need to, in faith, recognize that our loving God, who is all-powerful, is at work even in these sufferings. You know, Scripture says God works all things for good for those who love Him. And so we need to, to recognize, even in our difficulties, in, even in our struggles, that there is good going on here. There is more going on here than meets the eye, and therefore I submit myself to God's providential uh, care. Theologians, as a matter of fact, tell us that to the degree that we have faith in God, hope in God, and love for God, to that degree do we enjoy inner freedom. Inner freedom, which no one can take, so, take away from us, comes from our faith in God, our hope in God, and our love for God. And so, as Jesus said, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Brothers and sisters, learn to recognize this freedom Jesus has won for you. Trust in Him, believe in Him, love Him, and no one will be able to take that away from you. Do you recall the expression, you have not because you've asked not? I don't know about you, uh, but for me, maybe I'm just a little too focused on what's going on in my own life, but sometimes I don't um, realize the needs of others until, until someone asks me for something. And frankly, I appreciate being asked so that I can give. And so today we ask you to pray about supporting us on a regular basis. You may have noticed if you've watched Food for Life, we don't have uh, corporate sponsors. Our sponsors are you, the viewers, those who are in a position to, uh, to support us. And like a household, 
um, we have uh, monthly expenses. And so we're finding for ourselves what's ideal is to invite people to join us uh, in support on a monthly basis. And now we have a number of ways to uh, make that convenient for you. You can, um, you can donate online uh, or through um, post-dated checks or through uh, an automatic deductions from, uh, from your account or from your, your credit card. So we're, we're asking you today to consider, prayerfully consider supporting us uh, on a monthly basis. So to, to benefit, uh, benefit those potentially who are not able to support us. So we'd invite you to consider that today. We would like to thank you for your financial support of the Food for Life television ministry. Food for Life is funded only by viewers like yourself. We have no commercial sponsors. Your tax-deductible donations help pay for production of the program, pay the television station for the time that the program is on the air, and pay for the mailing of our monthly newsletter. Thank you again for your support of this Catholic television ministry. I'm always very touched when I read a letter from a viewer and they're sending in a gift to the ministry to help Food for Life stay on the air and they're apologetic because in their mind this gift is just too small. And, and I'm always moved by that because what you don't realize is that at Food for Life we appreciate every gift that comes into the ministry and it makes a difference and helps us to continue proclaiming the hope that we have in Christ. And I'd appeal to you today, if you've been watching Food for Life, if it's been a blessing to you in some way, that perhaps you would prayerfully consider a gift to the ministry. We need to hear from you. It's through your support, both your prayers and your financial gifts, that we're able to proclaim the gospel. So we hope that if you're blessed by Food for Life, you'll take the time to prayerfully consider writing in to us. For an audio CD or video DVD of today's ministry, we invite you to write to us. When you write, mention the program number 1417 and today's topic, Father Terry Donahue on Anger. Food for Life is a non-profit Catholic charity funded only by donations from viewers. To help us continue this Catholic television ministry, please send your tax-deductible donation to Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y 2T8. If every viewer gave a loony or a toony each week, all expenses would be met. If you have never donated before, we ask that you make your check payable to Food for Life. And our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. You may now make your donation online. Just go to our website at www.foodforlifetvministry.org and follow the link. Thanks to your faithful prayers and tax deductible financial support, Food for Life is the longest running Catholic television program in Canada. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Terry Donahue continues with his teaching on anger. But there are four reasons for executing punishment. When God punishes, it always is, first of all, to protect someone from attack, to defend those who are innocent, to defend those who are unjustly harmed. This has been the first segment of Father Terry Donahue's teaching on anger. For an audio CD or video DVD of this complete teaching, we invite you to write to us. Our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8.